Hey guys, welcome back to Daddy Knows Best. I just got in from San Diego and before that I was in Sun Valley, Idaho with a group called Higher Ground where they take veterans on these badass retreats and teach them how to snowboard, ice climb, surf, scuba, you name it. Look them up if you're a veteran. Check them out. They pay for everything. And uh, yeah, I was in San Diego for some shows. I did four shows at Madhouse Comedy Club. They showed me a lot of love over there and... They were some good shows. I got some great crowd work clips coming out from it. Tomorrow, which is Tuesday, which is technically today when the episode comes out, I am at Don't Tell Oceanside. And then Thursday, I'm at the Hollywood Improv, December 21st. And then the following Thursday, I'm back at the Improv for my Simper Funny show. This week's episode, I have on Jen Sturger. She's a Maxim and Playboy model. She was discovered at a football game. Brett Favre sent her his dick pic. She me too him, and this was before Me Too was a thing, so it didn't go how it usually goes now. And we talk about the trauma that came along with that and some personal stuff going on in our lives. And we connected on both having master's degrees in psychology, our love for animals, and our relationship problems <laughs> please like subscribe and comment below send to a friend review do it all do it all enjoy the episode thank you for watching Thank you for doing daddy knows best we is that what we're calling it now yeah we rebranded. <laughs> We had to. We're rebranding. We're in the middle of a rebrand. Daddy knows best. Are you daddy? I am. <laughs> you know what's crazy too is like. Please leave this in. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm definitely gonna leave it in. But my, you know, I looks like I like that was my girlfriend coined that that name, and I was like, that's so good. <gasps> Your girlfriend needs to be in therapy. <laughs> yeah, she is. Daddy knows best. And daddy's the therapist. <laughs> Jesus. No, but that's I do have a thing. master's in psychology, you know. Same. Do you really? Yes. Nice. So this will be like a really insightful conversation by two people that did absolutely nothing with it. <laughs> hey, we are. We're doing it right now. You know, I think that I think a psychology degree definitely helped me in stand up just for all of the personalities that we have to deal with alone. Yeah. You know? Oh my God. There's so many broken people in stand up. It's yeah. crazy. But I think it helps you kind of like. You understand it, but you also are like, but I'll keep you over here. Exactly. Yeah. Just diplomatic. It's it's like that. I don't have a lot of comedians. If you like that, daddy knows best. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm going to start saying shit like that. It'd be like that. It'd be like that sometimes. <laughs> cool, dude. What uh, So what was it like at FSU? My friends went there, uh, and I actually went to your guys' championship when you played against Auburn. And, oh, that and was that so comeback. much fun. I was there at the Rose Bowl. That was so much fun. But fun fact, I had just gotten like my fourth boob job like maybe 10 days before that. Why do you get... I feel like that's a one and done. No, they're tires, man. You have to rotate them and change them. <laughs> um, but I had just gotten surgery like 10 days before. <laughs> they're tired. And so I was like still on pain meds. And I just remember when we uh, we ran that back for a touchdown, I went to go jump and I was mid jump and realized that what goes up must come down and that uh, gravity was going to be a bitch when I hit. Ooh. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> and no. just like grabbed my chest. You were chest. at the game too? Yeah, I was there at the game. That's sick. Didn't you do um, sports announcing for them? Or no, like I've you never were... done sports announcing for them. I was like an unofficial mascot. Yeah, because I saw you on the field with like yeah. a microphone and stuff. Yeah, but that was just like an unofficial mascot type stuff. That was uh, another part of my life. That's cool. Uh, I worked for uh, the Jets and I worked for Sports Illustrated and ESPN and everybody else, but not Florida State, not Florida State. That's sick. That's just purely a uh, purely a passion project. Yeah. Purely like just for the love of, of college football, you know? That's pretty cool though, because if I went to my school, they'd be like, who the fuck are you? They wouldn't even... So oh. it's cool that you're like a mascot there. <laughs> Listen, it's not an endorsed mascot thing. You know what I mean? It's like a, it's like a, there have been conversations with me in the school. Like, are you using our trademark? Are you oh, making really? any money off of us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. If so, we want to cut. What um, money would you be making from FSU? Right? 
The only money I made was bartending when I worked there. Like, like when I when I went to school there. That's it. But otherwise, I didn't make any money off Florida State. Did it open doors for me by being discovered there? Absolutely. How were you discovered there? At a football game. Really? Yeah. Oh, you just like were on the big screen. They're like, who the fuck is that? We got to get her. It was very Pamela Anderson-esque. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So like you were on the Jumbotron or no, whatever No, I was on national television. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was on ABC. And then they were like... And Brent Musburger saw a picture of me and was like, 1,500 red-blooded young American men just signed up to go to Florida State. <laughs> I was like, that's a very, that's a very precise number, but yeah. okay. That's cool. Um, but yeah, that's how that all started. And then somehow turned into a broadcasting career. And then from a broadcasting career, became a hosting career. And eventually landed me in stand-up, you know? Um, Dope. Yeah, you're killing it. I see you uh, getting a lot of Laugh Factory spots. I know. Laugh Factory, improv. Like, I did the improv and the Laugh Factory the other night in the same night. That's so cool. And it just was like, it was one of those moments where... I feel like I should have celebrated it more for myself. I, I'm, I don't know how you are about this. I'm really bad about celebrating my wins. I don't celebrate. Exactly. I'm like, what's oh. fucking next? Exactly. I mean, what's next? And, but I, that I, night I, I'll something... have a couple beers or something. But... but it wasn't even that. It was more just acknowledging what a landmark that was in comedy for me to yeah. do two of the biggest clubs in town yeah. in a town that... There's select like you're it's on lineups with bona fide celebrities. Yeah, and national headliners exactly. at those clubs exactly. especially. And there I was amongst them. You was, know? was this when the next day you had a migraine? Yeah. So you celebrated with a migraine. No. Oh yeah, no, no. I had a migraine the night before. But I think oh. it's because I was up until like one thirty in the morning singing Bohemian Rhapsody with Craig Robinson. Oh, that's cool. That might have had something to do with that. That probably did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he fucking gets down. He gets down, and he'll and stay forever. Yeah, I, I think I think they actually have like a, a bedroom set up for him in the Laugh Factory. Uh, oh, really? In the, they have to because he's there so late. He's there so <laughs> he late. He shuts that shit down. He really does. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, that's cool. I uh, I have on here Maxim and Playboy. Yep, did all of that. I didn't know a lot of this to be honest until I started doing research to prepare for the podcast. I was like, why? I was like, why are we? Why are we talking like we don't know each other? And then I was like, oh, you didn't know I had any of this crazy stuff in my backstory, no. did you? Uh, uh-uh. uh, I just knew yeah. you did comedy. Oh, and like I, I knew I you. Legitimate. I knew you did the sports. <laughs> well, I knew you did the sports stuff, but like yeah. I didn't know you're a Maxim Playboy. I didn't know I did all of that. about this other stuff we'll get into, which is super juicy. And what's crazy is I did them out of order. Like you're normally supposed to do back in the two th- early 2000s or mid 2000s. You were supposed to do Maxim and then Playboy because once you showed it all. Oh, yeah. Where are we to go from here? No one wants to see you in a bikini. You did Playboy then Maxim? I did Playboy and then Maxim because I was so popular at the time. Both wanted a piece of it. That's you know? sick. And so I shot Playboy. And then like two weeks later, Maxim came around and they were like, when's your Playboy come out? And I was like, I don't know, May. And they're like, great, we'll, we'll publish you in March. Oh, wow. So I ended up, they published it beforehand. Oh. I was in New York shooting for Maxim the very next week, which was a crazy experience because I did it with two other girls that I was friends with in college. And um, they have like similar uh, trajectory of, of being discovered. Through yeah, the but sports they didn't stuff. do anything with it. They just, you know, it, that's where it ended. Hopefully they're not you know? listening. No, no, no. They... They went their own ways. Like, they chose their own paths. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, one became a, a cheerleader for the Dolphins, and then the other went to get her master's in, like, architecture and stuff like that. Like, she's... Hell yeah. She's a genius. Um, That's cool. You never guess it <laughs> by, the, by the way she talks sometimes. <laughs> Damn. And she'll admit that to herself. But, um, but, yeah, I think I was just kind of... I just ran with it, you know? How did you discover comedy? I always wanted to do comedy. Really? Yeah. My parents took me to comedy shows when I was really young and I probably... That's so cool. Yeah, where I was like, I don't have good parents. Like, looking back, I'm like, I didn't have good parents. Um, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> that's, they just exposed me That's a cool me to, exposure, though. Yeah, they exposed me to stuff like that very early on. And um, comedy was just... It was always how I dealt with real life. Yeah. You know? I think it was just a coping mechanism. That's exactly uh, Whether what it's it is. unhealthy or healthy. Uh, I believe that people who are funny suffered a lot in some way, shape, or form. A hundred percent. And my therapist bills would definitely agree with you. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Thank you, U.S. government. <laughs> uh, that's, I don't have that. I don't have that fortunate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
backing. You can. You can still join. I think you, there's there's a possibility. They need like, a new you're mascot. You're already dressed for it. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the jacket. Yeah, no, absolutely not. That's hilarious. Uh, do you read? Mm-hmm. Do, what kind of books do you read? I mean, this won't shock you. Like, mostly self-help stuff. That's mostly what I read. It's most not self help. I say self improvement. Self improvement was just about what I was going to say. It's yeah. not necessarily self help because that implies you need it and you need oh, the I help. I do need it. I think everyone. <laughs> I think everyone needs to work on themselves. But they you don't. Know? No, they don't. I but think it's the most important project. It is the full time job that we all should have and not get paid for. You know what yeah. I mean? It's how much time do you dedicate to being a better person? Yeah, and, and you do get paid for it later on. You do. It gives dividends. Oh yeah, for sure. But I. I spend a lot of time with that kind of stuff and whether it's, you know, life hacks or just like human behavior and like understanding why people do the things that they do. I'm just, I feel like since the day I, uh, I stepped foot on this planet, I've been trying to figure out why people are the way they are, Yeah, you know, myself included. Absolutely. And that's why I gravitated towards psychology. I think a lot of people in my life think that I think too much. Yeah, and that I'm an I, overthinker too. Well, yeah, I think too much and I am very introspective and mm-hmm. like I love talking about brain stuff and they're just like, ew, why? Like just live. And I'm like, I am living, but I'm living at a higher level of like consciousness than you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. For better or for worse. Yeah, I agree. I like that stuff. That's cool. I didn't know we had that in common. Yeah. What are your, like your top three favorite self-improvement books? Oh, you know what? One of the best books I... uh I've read so far is this book called Adult Children of Emotionally Immature, Immature Parents. Parents. I just finished it this year. Isn't it It's the best crazy. book I've ever read. I think yeah. if you are looking for a book about mental health. That's so crazy. I literally have that on my night. I get chills because I just read that and it's one of the best books I've ever read, especially dealing with like my parents. Yeah. I And I that it makes a lot of sense why you become comics. You know yeah. what I mean? Is uh, I think a lot of us were, I think comics come from one of two places they come from like you were told how awesome you were all the time which that or, i had some of that too or the complete opposite oh, i didn't have any of that my mom would tell me how awesome i was and then my dad would tell me i'm a big of a piece of shit i was <laughs> <laughs> they're like we got to keep them balanced <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um i i got told all the time that you know i needed to be perfect my best wasn't good enough mm-hmm. i bring home straight a's and they'd be like good do it again uh, and then my dad would just say, uh, bye. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, that's <laughs> he, tough. He didn't, like, leave or anything, but he just wasn't around a lot, you know? And so um, I think I definitely kind of took on, like, a more masculine energy, like, mm-hmm. trying to, like, gain his affection. Like, yeah. being, like, the firstborn and, like, the daughter that he was like, oh, it's a girl. Yeah. You know? I love what that book says about that, how we're just trying to make them proud and, like, Uh to understand and just to, like, let go of that shit. Like, they don't have the capacity for certain things and that just to accept and, you know, speak your mind. But, like, after that, let go of them Let go of it and you can't be, like, results driven with, like, them them coming around. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, you understand people's capacity. Yeah. And it also says once you start applying that, they actually come around more. And I've experienced it since I've been applying it. And check this out. My mom bought that book. And I never, like, the next day I wrote her a text message crying in my car, like, I'm so proud. I'd never thought in a million years that you would buy that book. And yeah, it was so, it was cool. So we'll see. I think when you understand that your behavior is usually a direct reflection of the environment that you were raised in and by the people you were raised by, I think you judge yourself less and you're like, Oh, this was always how it was going to be. Yeah. And how can I be better? Yeah, exactly. And if you don't ask, how can I be better? I don't, I don't fuck with you. (laughs) Yeah. Which a lot of people don't, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, I'm big on surrounding myself with. So that was a big book for me. I loved this book uh, called Homecoming. I haven't read that one. I'm going to write it down. Homecoming is a great book. Uh, I think that one, obviously, The Body Keeps the Score. If you've experienced any kind of trauma. Yeah, I haven't read that yet That is a tough read. Really? Just Uh, like dense? I, I did it through Audible. And I just remember I had to take, it's not that it's dense. It's that the material is so heavy. 
but it really explains like how trauma is stored in the body. I feel and I it. Think, I yeah, I think as someone with a military background, like that's something that yeah, I think you should you should be handed that the minute you enroll. You know what I mean? What? Like the minute oh, you that enlist, book? I think you should have to read that book. <laughs> what was the oh homecoming? Yeah, homecoming and the body keeps the score. I haven't read. I've heard of uh, body keeps the score, and it's been on my list. Yeah. So I just I, added uh, that. But I I'm a big reader, and I. <laughs> What's homecoming about? Homecoming is kind of like getting back to your authenticity when you feel mm. like you strayed from yourself and feeling like you've got to live up to expectations of other people or like when something earth shattering happens to you and you feel like lost. Like that's kind of what it's about. It's about coming back to yourself and your authenticity. And it's written by the woman who is currently the president of the uh, APA. So, okay. Yeah. So like. She's legit. You know what I mean? Um, my latest book that I'm reading is kind of a, uh, it's kind of a dark one. It's called Staring at the Sun. Oh, really? Yeah. What's that about? Uh, it's about uh, death anxiety. <laughs> I have that so badly. Like, I seriously have existential crisis. I can't smoke weed because I'll start thinking about the purpose and, like, life yep, and, like, yep, yep. why we're here. Yeah. Well, so. Um, What's that one called? It's called Staring at the Sun, and that one's really interesting for me because I, I got turned on to it by a friend of mine um, because I uh, my ex-father-in-law passed away. Okay. And were you guys pretty close? It wasn't necessarily that, I, that we were close. It was more that I, I think when, when someone passes away that you feel like you could have helped. And I and like, it's like when you deal with people that have like addiction. Oh, he had addiction. You know, yeah, exactly. Uh, like you, alcohol, alcohol, you know, pills, things like that. And I think it's your father-in-law. Yeah. Your, your my ex-father-in-law. Ex father Fuck, and, that's tough. But like, it's not the first time, especially working in comedy that I've lost somebody that I cared about, you know, to, especially with the fentanyl going on. Yeah. To addiction. <laughs> and no worries to addiction. And I just kind of wanted I just kind of wanted to be told like, hey, it's okay. You did everything that you could. And yeah. like, and I think that uh, it talks a lot about how death anxiety like manifests in people without them even realizing that that's what it is. We all have it. Yeah, we it's all have it. It's the scariest thing that, we ever had to face. That, it's the biggest unknown. Yeah, it's that thing that if you're like, man, I'm running out of time. You know what I mean? Like running, that whole concept of running out of time yeah. is simply just death anxiety. But I've been thinking about death for when I was like in my early twenties when Same. I saw plenty of time. Same. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. And then I've done a lot of psychedelics that have kind of opened up my mind to I certain. I have done it yet. Like but I'm shrooms. Thinking about, I tried shrooms, but I don't think I took enough of a dose because like the only, the only enlightenment I got on mushrooms was man, I cried over a lot of dudes that didn't have headboards. <laughs> that's, all that, that's all that came out that's for me. That's still a realization. <laughs> and like now you know that they, they got to have a headboard. <laughs> they got to have – like Jen, his bed was on milk crates. But like, the, hey, I, bet that, I bet that dude could fuck. <laughs> that's probably like top three. That was the real milk crate challenge. The milk crate man. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's all I got out of it. I really want to try it again. I've had friends that have done, you know, obviously do a ton of mushrooms. Um, some have talked about doing DMT or ketamine. You know I've what I mean? done DMT, yeah. yeah. And then um, one of my therapists that I had on from one of my from my master's program, they do uh, drug induced therapy now, which is becoming like a real thing where you're yeah. with a professional and they guide you through your trip and help so you it's process not just like it. Your, your buddy who's like totally unqualified, <laughs> yeah. like, bro, you're fine. Yeah. You're yeah. Fine. I wish I had done that because I, I think, uh, if you have a bad trip and you've already got stuff I've had going bad on, trips. Same! yeah. And it sucks. It's awful. I didn't do shrooms for 10 years. I had such a bad trip. On shrooms? Yeah. Oh, see, yeah, no. I didn't have that. Mine was just, I I mixed edibles. Oh. Like, I mixed strains, and it was just a really bad combo for me. I don't really fuck with weed that much, because, like, I don't know, I'll smoke, like, a handful of times with my girlfriend a year, and every time after, I'm like, why did I do this? It just yeah. gives me anxiety. Sometimes oh. there's a few times where I'm, like, laughing, having fun, but there's always that 
dread that comes back. So I had those experiences. And then um, during the pandemic, when all my television work calmed down, I actually started working in cannabis. Oh, really? And I became like so well educated about it that uh, like I was going around like teaching about like the medicinal properties of cannabis Mm -hmm. and how to work with people who have PTSD in a way that's more controlled with cannabis versus just them going to a dispensary and essentially medicating themselves because it's not one size fits all you no, know and it's so strong like yeah, it's I, very, so strong. very very little of well, the that stuff happened we during, have that happened during the pandemic too is everybody's tolerance got so high because we were all smoking so much weed that uh people were just cranking up the thc and that's not the beneficial part right it's the cbd which is so low in the it's weed the we CBD smoke CBD, and it's all the different terpenes that are involved that are the ones that the parts that have weed that are beneficial and so like that was what i would go around and do is was educate you really know, how to use how to use cannabis in a way that's for medicine purposes and mm-hmm. not just to get high yeah what how can you test for the terpenes um they have all of that like california is is getting better at it colorado is really good at it about listing out what the different terpenes and stuff are mm-hmm. and just look them up online usually people that have really high anxiety and stuff should stay away from like anything that's like too uplifting yeah because if you get that really high lift at the beginning it can kind of feel like uh you're at the top of a roller coaster and your seat comes undone and you're just like hold like you're white knuckling through it yeah like that's that's how my f- yeah, that's what i feel yeah exactly and that's a terrible feeling yeah. but if you take the stuff that that has less of certain chemicals in it you don't get that lift and it feels you're like oh i'm just gonna melt in my couch and watch the office for four hours yeah like the indicas and stuff (laughs) exactly yeah that's true all right i have on here the douchebag daily double which is one of my favorites oh god where you say the douchiest thing that's ever happened to you and the douchiest thing you've ever done to someone else that you're comfortable disclosing okay the douchiest thing i've ever done hmm okay but to be fair i feel like this actually shows how innovative I am, <laughs> and uh, is it, what a clever, is it petty too? what a clever po- problem solver I am. Okay. No, I thought about this. Um, I was seeing this guy, and this was like in my mid twenties, and we like had just started seeing each other, and he invited me down to the Jersey Shore. First Ooh, mistake. First mistake. To do okay? some fist bumping. Oh, uh, but yeah, he probably wanted to bump more than that. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I. So I went against all my better judgment and I broke the first cardinal rule of gin, which is like always be able to leave on your own accord. Oh, and you rode with him. And I rode with him down there. Mm, and this is before Uber was a thing. Yeah, this yeah. is before Uber was a thing. So it's like a taxi, but like it's going to oh. be so expensive, yeah. et cetera. That's like a couple hours drive. Um, And we got down there. And there was just absolute shenanigans taking place. Um, I don't even know if, I, like, it's such a wild story. I don't know if I should even tell it. Um, do on it. Recording. Do it. Dude, it's so wild. <laughs> like, you wouldn't believe oh. me if I told you. I told the story of how I, like, broke into this chick's house after when her and her family were gone and robbed them after I took her virginity, like, a Okay. A month okay. before. Then this is the safe I space. I was <laughs> such. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So listen, this is not the part that makes me the douchebag. Oh, good. Okay. So. Oh, I like that you started with your yours first. So I'm just giving you the backstory. Um. So. Uh. So he, we were gonna stay at like his friend's house. We take like a wagon from like the house we're staying at, like a kid's wagon that mm-hmm. belonged to his like niece or whatever. With the little red one? Yes, a little red one. And we pack like bedding in it because he's like, oh, we just told we had to take linens with us to the other beach house because these are all beach houses in a sleepy little town. Yeah. So we walked over there, started to get set up or whatever and get checked in for the night. And these four... This is like an Airbnb or something? It's his buddy's house. Oh, okay. And these four super drunk, messed up people, like young people, kind of flop into the house. And they're like, oh, so-and-so said we could crash here tonight. Is that oh, cool? No. So now it's become six of us in this house. Yeah. In a one-bedroom, like, small beach house. Wow. Did that so-and-so actually say that? We have no idea. But what transpired next? So... We went into the bedroom, whatever. I'm just like, we're going to turn in for the night. They turn on like crazy house music because, Uh. again, Jersey Shore. 
And what transpires in that living room is something that I I think you can only witness it now on Pornhub. Oh, God. <laughs> like insane sounds. Like I open the door and there is like a full on group sesh going on really? in the living room of this house because they're on drugs. Oh, and there was like two girls, two guys, two girls, two guys. And I just shut the door and I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I was just like sitting there and we're like, what are we going to do? And what was like, he doing? This guy and I are not on that level. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so like we we're like looking at each other and I'm like, absolutely not. First of all, <laughs> like, yeah. let's get it clear. That's not happening. Uh, but second of all, like, what are we going to do? Like, I can't sleep in, in the middle of an EDM concert. I just can't. Yeah. On an orgy. Exactly. And an orgy. Exactly. More yeah. importantly, an orgy. Whew. So we're trying to figure out how we're going to get out of it. We're like, maybe just like let them finish and like maybe they'll leave. They'll never finish. They're on drugs. They're on drugs. It's going to be like two hours minimum. So he's like keeping his cool. We're just kind of sitting there just trying to block out all of the crazy shenanigans and the noise going on. And all of a sudden he hears them move the wagon, his niece's wagon. And like something in him snaps and he storms out there. And all I hear, I don't know what happened, but I heard, hey, get your dirty assholes off my wagon. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So at this point, I'm like, we got to go. So I just walk through. I don't make eye contact with anyone. I walk through the house to go leave. And I go to leave. And he's like walking with me. And we're walking back to the original house. And we're just going to sleep on the floor in the living room at this point. Who's at the original house? Like the friends. more friends. Okay. Like it was normal like a bunch people. of more normal people. Like yeah. a family. He's you know like, what I mean? We'll put Jen in it. Or we'll put, we'll put the Bob young guys. and his new girlfriend yeah, exactly. with the orgy guys over well, there. We didn't know. <laughs> so, no, but the other guy yeah. knew. But we, oh, I, he had to have. And so we were walking back and like he tried to hold my hands and I was like, absolutely not. I was like, no. And I wanted to go home at this point. But again, yeah, I'm stuck you're there. stuck. So the next day I was like, I really want to go home. Like, I felt like I was set up in a really weird situation. This isn't cool. Oh, you think he was in on it in some way? I have no idea. But I was uncomfortable and I was trying to get out. of course. And there was another couple that was there and she had a car. The girl had drove down and they were already like having like weird energy all weekend. So being the douchebag, I was like, hey, like, you're totally right. I was like, yeah, you've been totally right this whole weekend. <laughs> like, I basically started, like, being that little, like, Jiminy Cricket in her ear and was like, yeah, we should totally leave. He's been a piece of He's shit He's been a this piece of shit. Time. Yeah, girlfriend. He's been a totally piece of shit. Oh, my God. And so I was like, you know what we should do? We should drive. We should drive home. We should leave. I'll go with you. And so I convinced her to leave. That's not that bad. <laughs> I thought you were going to, like, take her boyfriend. No! You're too nice. So, yeah, I, I made a couple get in a fight. So that way she would drive me home so Did I she? could abandon. Yep. And then what happened with the couple? Did you follow up? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry if I ruined their relationship. I don't know what happened to them. I, I have no idea. But I, 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 I practically broke them up that weekend. That's funny. Was he a bit of an asshole? Who? The, the other guy. None of them were. I mean, they hung out at the Jersey Shore. You know what I mean? That's not the place to hang. In the early, in the mid 2000s, absolutely not. You know what I mean? Was this when uh, Jersey Shore was going on? Yes. Oh, I love that show. Like around then, you know? This was like 2000. It was such. It's the only like reality TV show I got into. Really? Yeah. I can see that. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's the douchiest one. Yeah. But as far as the douchiest thing that's been done to me, uh, Oh, yeah. It's very Googleable. Uh, a guy sent me a picture of his dick that I worked with. Oh, I, I have that, that on that, here, too. Exactly. I think that is... I didn't know that was you that got sent that. Like, I knew that yeah. he sent it, and uh, yeah, but I didn't know You're it like, sent it to I my friend, her. Jen. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the douchiest thing that's ever happened but, to me. And it was, like, uh, unprovoked, too, right? Yeah. From what I read, like... Yeah. I, it, was a, it was a Hail Mary. It was... <laughs> No, but he's, he's, you know, he's usually pretty same, good at yeah, exactly. nailing those Hail Marys, but no, this he's one. He's, he throws more pick six than anybody else. <laughs> See, he I, was so I, big. Yeah, I have no idea. Exactly. You have no idea what you're talking about. It's fine. <laughs> at least you admit it. Yeah, I yeah. love when guys are like, I know a lot about sports. And I'm like, calm down. No, um, I know a lot about like 
I'll take it from here. Martial arts, but not even the people that do it. But like, I just, I don't follow. I watch yeah. the highlights now. I'm too busy to, Yeah. I grew up watching and playing sports, but I just, yeah. So when you're like the sports media and you're like, no, he didn't. I was like, she's probably right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, but so that, that's the douchiest thing that ever happened to me. That's awful. And then I read like a couple of your remarks from it and how it's like, negatively infected you in this way that it shouldn't have and like well it cost me everything at the time you know what i mean like it cost me my entire career you know why do you think that is because it it was pre me too yeah it was before me too happened it was i was you know hashtag me too soon like i just (laughs) no one good hashtag yeah no one no one cared you know man no one cared but why do you think it negatively impacted your career because i lost everything and because but why because at the end of the day, the media was very complicit in how I was painted. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like they played a huge part in it. I actually I just taught a class about this this morning at, at University of Florida, and they kind of took his side and or they protected him. Yeah. You know, they protected him. They painted the story as like they painted me as like some money hungry person. And but how could you get money f- like? The minimal amount of money you would make on even just disclosing this story is negligible. Yeah. And not worth anything. And, it, and, and look, it's on the record that, like, I had nothing to do with it coming out. The person that actually sold me out came out and said every, like, basically admitted it. It was like a friend that you're like, hey, this dude. It was another, it was a journalist that I shared a story with in confidence. So, like, when I talk about this to sports media classes, you know, a lot of it is, hey, off the record conversations are off the record conversations. Yeah. And you, you say that, right? Your Absolutely. You have to protect your sources. Yeah. You know, and this was a conversation that was had between two colleagues. On a podcast. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, 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 not on a podcast. <laughs> well, but, you're like... <laughs> no, but like this was a conversation that was had between two people that worked together. Sure. You know? In confidence. Exactly. Yeah. When you're like, like hey, keep this between us. Yeah. Basic courtesy. Absolutely. So you're obviously not friends with that person anymore. No, um, but I, I did forgive them. That's good for yourself. Yes. You don't forgive people for the other person. Mm-hmm. You forgive them for yourself. Yeah, because that anger, carrying it around. Yeah. And we have a crazy story, too. You want to talk about a good podcast to listen to? There was I actually sat down and did a podcast with him about it. With who? With the guy that sold me out. Oh, we sat down and guy. we had a conversation together. How did that go? Really well, um, because the thing that actually ended up bringing us together was uh, me working in animal rescue, really? me running a nonprofit. He ended up adopting. Do you still do that? Uh, not as much anymore. It became like really heart heavy. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'd be on stage at shows, and I get a text like, "Hey Jen, I just found two huskies banging on the one, <laughs> the one thirty four. Can you come pick them up?" You Jesus. know what I mean? Like I'm like I'm. I got to finish my set, you know, it just, uh, animal rescue never stopped. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was always so much hurt in the world and such a need, um, because we have such a huge pet population problem, Yeah, especially here in Los Angeles that like, I just, cause people are fucking irresponsible. Like you get a pet, it's your pet for life. Exactly. Exactly. Even if they're pieces of shit. (laughs) <laughs> I that was the first thing I said when I walked into your place is one you have a cat wow and two dude but when I saw it was a bangle I was like oh yeah I was like you have seen some shit yeah <laughs> I, people are like oh you have PTSD from the Marines no I have PTSD from that <laughs> fucking cat <laughs> they are something man if you don't give them like activities yeah she like, has a giant wheel she runs on. Like no way oh yeah yeah I fucking talked to my roommate and let me put it in his room he's like dude I. He's from Spain. He's like this big, really nice like guy. And he was like, I didn't know the wheel was that big. Like <laughs> three years into like having it in his room, I'm like, well, you're fucking stuck with it. It's like a four hundred dollar wheel. It's like, insane. Does yeah. she does she use she it? She loves it. Yeah. I actually shut his door because she'll go in there and run. You'll hear it in the pot like I'll show you before you Just leave. Just WD forty that thing, man. I know, I need to. That's hilarious. But yeah, if you don't give them activities, they will destroy your entire place. Yeah. She sucks. They will. Ha- she will condemn your apartment. <laughs> Dude, I got that cat because my dog loved cats, and this roommate was the first roommate I had that didn't have a cat. I was, and I'm allergic to cats. And Bengals are supposed to be hypoallergenic. That's bullshit. They're not. Yeah. I just take Flonase every day, and now my dog died, and now I'm stuck with this fucking cat. 
and I'll keep the cat for the duration of her life. And we have um, a love hate relationship. That's but, hilarious. Like she knows she's not supposed to scratch this. This is like, yeah, uh, a really good couch. And yeah. she fucking did it when I'm sitting here. And I, like when you got here, <laughs> could not believe it. Yeah. But you know, I, I love animals and I love doing animal rescue because, um, Animals couldn't Google search me. You know what I mean? Like animals didn't care about my backstory. They didn't care who I was. They just knew that I was showing them love and compassion and and getting them out of bad situations. You know what I mean? And I just was always, I've always loved animals like that. I think animals are the most pure thing in the world. My dog, Kevin, is amazing. I got him from a hoarding situation. That's such a human name. Listen, you knew I wasn't going to have kids (laughs) when I gave my dog a human name. That's funny. I also saw you lost an asshole cat of your own recently. So I'm sorry. It still hurts. I'm sure. I'm like that. She was my frenemy, you know? She mm-hmm. was my OG frenemy. That's what she is. Yeah. Like, but you could at least pet your, you can touch your cat. Yeah. Oh, this my cat. My cat was like, don't touch me. You can look at me. Really? Like, if, Even you, if to, she'd up to ended end? up with anyone else, she would have been in the shelter. Oh, and um, then probably put down, unfortunately. Yeah. But towards the end, she started looking like, um, that cat from Pet Cemetery. She was oh, just like stared. God. She would just stared. Th- it was. I didn't have a cat. I had a haunting. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you just. How old did they get? She's twenty. Twenty. That's so fucking old. I, if that cat lives till she's twenty. <laughs> I got news fucking... for you, dude. Bengals don't live. Or they're they're fourteen to sixteen. I think when I looked it up, twelve to sixteen. You're like they don't live very long when people leave doors open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, but you when you would adopt a cat or you adopt an animal, you adopt it. You commit to it for its life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and that cat, people would unknowingly want her mm-hmm. not because she's really pretty, but she has a lot of, uh, like you said, they, they need, like I had to play with her every day. People I say the same thing about me, so I, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If not, she'll fuck up your furniture. <laughs> exactly. They're like, you know, people like her because she's pretty, but yeah, she'll burn yeah. your place down if you're not watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She'll piss in the bathtub. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're like still talking about the cat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's hilarious. I actually have aluminum foil in my bathtub right now because my cat will like. She, I trained her to use the toilet, but if she's mad at me, she'll just go piss in my bathtub. And I'm like, you fucking bitch. I get so mad. Listen, there are like way worse the... places for her to do that. At least it's still very easy to clean. You know, that's what I tell myself. That's that's part of my calming down And that's why you look like ritual. a crazy person. That's like waiting for an alien invasion because your tub is lined with oh, yeah, foil. Yeah, 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 yeah. My buddy came. They walk in and they're like, oh, he was definitely in the military. He's seen some shit. There's foil <laughs> in his tub. That's for the cat. I'm like, yeah, that's for the meth, dude. I'm cooking it up in the bathtub. That's what it looks like when I look in there. I'm like, well, this doesn't look good it looks good and then on top of the foil is uh what you doing in here bro (laughs) it's the press and seal fucking saran wrap upside down just in case she because the foil is not enough i heard her like step on the foil i was like okay bitch so i got like a fucking fly trap in there for yeah we're getting it done (laughs) she's seven setting up she's seven kevin McAllister level from home alone you know what i mean like kevin McAllister level traps for your cat she's the worst dude (laughs) she really is and i thought she would they trick you with the looks they do i've never related to another to an animal so much in my life you should get a bengal no (laughs) i i walked in and i was like oh I know. Yeah. I know from working with them at Animal Rescue. Yeah, because people get them and like put them up for adoption because yeah. they're nightmares. A comic uh, that I know recently found one because, again, people get these cats and then they dump them because they're such a handful that they aren't. They want them for the look because mm-hmm. they look like little leopards. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Beautiful. But then when they, they're beautiful. But the minute they start getting their personality, they're like, get this, get yeah. this satanic creature out of my house they're like little comics they're yeah. broken yeah and they test shit <laughs> <laughs> <You need> therapy <laughs> yeah she really does 
And then uh, when I was crying because I lost my dog this year, and, like, the f- day after, I was just bawling, and she had never heard me ball, and she was, like, trying to comfort me and, like, chirping at me. And then when I didn't respond, she bit my arm. She's never <laughs> bit me. Hey, snap out of it, bitch. I'm still here. Oh, I snatched her up. I said, hey, you don't fucking bite me. And, like, now when I cry, she's like, fuck you, buddy. You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> I have on here uh, the your biggest growth for the year. What would you say? My biggest growth for the year. Um, I'm really working right now on leaning back into my authenticity and being seen. Like being seen as a comic. Yeah. Because that's something that's like I've been very precious about. Like I don't mm-hmm. – I'm really bad. I don't post clips of my stand-up and things like that. Um. And I think it has to do with the way that I was treated during all the Favre stuff and just being inundated with uh, everyone's opinions of me. Oh, you're going to, as soon as you start posting clips, it's going to, you're going to get that. Oh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to hand my social media off to somebody when it comes to my comedy clips. I I wish I could do that. I can't look at the comments. There's so many hateful comments. And the better it does. Oh yeah. The better it does, the more hate you get. The more love you get too, but like the more hate you get, like... Oh yeah, I have. Mm-hmm. And but you know what I do? I just click hide because then no one can see their bullshit hate, and it's still boosting my algorithm. Hide what? You can hide their comment on all platforms except for TikTok. Nice. And, okay. Good to know. Yeah, and I just click hide, and then yeah, at the end of the day, it'll be like uh, I don't know. It'll be like fucking eat your words eventually. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, worked for Matt. Matt. Matt Rife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He responds to some of them. I don't respond to them. Oh, I respond to some of them. Um, I can't help myself, though. It's a compulsion. Yeah. It's I, a part of my personality where I'm like, oh, yeah? I've done it in the past. And, like, I've found, like, fucked up shit about them on their profiles and, like, screenshotted it and then put it. But then it, it just gives me... It makes me yeah, less happy on like, the inside. Oh man, why did I engage with that person? Yeah, and also it's no not... one's ever read an internet comment reply and been like, they have a point. Yeah, and like I don't know, I just ignore. It. And if they keep, uh, a lot of times on Facebook they'll just keep coming at different videos. That fucking all oh, you talk about is military. Oh, you're not even funny. Oh, and this and I go okay, and then I just block them. Yeah. So I've blocked like hundreds of people. Oh, man, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> no, in fact, anybody I've talked to, they all receive it. Okay, the well, that makes me get... feel a little bit better. Yeah. Some comics won't even read it. Like I talked to uh, Michael Blaustein, and he's like, I don't even fucking read him. Yeah. And that's the thing is I, I'm just, so that's what I'm working on is just working on being okay being seen, being okay being misunderstood, and knowing at the end of the day I'm a good person, you know? Yeah. I think the stuff I went through with the Brett Favre stuff really instilled in me this this deep um like core belief that I'm bad so bad things happen to me uh. and like that I don't matter and that when bad things happen to me it doesn't matter because I deserve them. Yeah, and then and you create like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. And then you you make all of your choices in life based on that false belief that that false narrative that you're running about yourself. And so my biggest growth for this year has been really just getting back to who I am. Because I also think I got lost in my marriage. Yeah, when I met you, you were actually going through a divorce. Yeah. So I... I it was I, like end of pandemic. Yeah. I just think that the writing was on the wall for a really long time because he didn't like me doing stand-up, even though he said he was fine with it. Um didn't understand the hours, didn't understand the exposure that comes with it and how vulnerable and honest you have to be when you do stand up. Cuz I think if you're not, the audience smells it when you're lying. Oh my god, not only do they, yeah, I'm I'm dealing with it with my girlfriend's family right now because I post whatever and like she'll clear stuff, but that's not cool with her conservative family. And like I have the best values that I've worked hard on, just like you have. I've read every self improvement book. I have a master's degree. My kid's college is paid for. My kid's medical will be paid for. My wife's medical will be paid for. Like I'm a I'm a fucking catch. But you're not a super dirty comic either. You know what I mean? It sucks when the parents don't like you. My mother in law definitely played a big part in me and my uh, my ex divorce for sure. Yeah, they just had a really weird relationship. 
but it's really lended itself to a lot of great material for stand up. <laughs> <laughs> bringing like mommy issues like, for sure i i don't think i've ever been as unhinged on stage as the night that i was like i had just i had just been like going through it and dealing with her and i went on stage in like full mrs mazel mode and was just like let me tell you about my day yeah. and like people that were at that show were still like that was hilarious that's awesome they were like that was such a fun they go it didn't look fun for you but it was amazing for us you know that's hilarious um but uh, i think at well, the do you end have of the any day, advice dealing with yeah family like that boundaries um uh, my ex's parents like they got divorced like six months before we got divorced you Ugh. know so it just goes to show you like something was going on unhealthy patterns are being repeated right. and i chose to break them i chose to end them good yeah and now you are better at spotting it yes probably but it is up to your, yeah but it is up to your partner to set those boundaries of course you yeah. know that's not something you can do no you can have those open and honest conversations but at the end of the day it is up to the other person to be like hey uh and now your watch has ended yeah. you know what i mean like like you're you're you can concede yeah you can like let me live my life and you can enter the next chapter of your life with me which is like being a grandparent maybe you know what yeah, i mean exactly. or like supporting me on whatever my next journey is in this relationship like when his mom started like meddling with like me paying for my our cat's cancer treatment i was like fuck you this is not your like yeah. i could tell she was in his head she'd be like that's too much money to spend on an animal and I was like, guess what? I make it. Yeah. And I and if your son wouldn't have let our cat insurance lapse, this wouldn't even be an issue. Yeah. So he's you know paying I mean? for part of it too. Like, get over it. No. I, no. I, I, paid, pay for... I pay for it all. Uh, I pay for it all. I'm sorry. But it's stuff like that where you're like, a sp that's just like a very specific example where it's like, oh, that yeah. was a big decision that the two of us had to make together. Yeah. And I could tell she was like in his year. And I'm like, no, be a man. Yeah. Be a man. And set a boundary yeah and he couldn't do it because he still relied on his mother too much for for support and money and things like that you know what i mean like invalidation yeah you can't you can't rely on people for outside things like that yeah she's really she's getting good at like setting healthy boundaries and and that sounds good and man. it's great it's the best relationship i've ever been in it's so healthy we work on we talk about things we communicate well we both read uh, one of my favorite books, Nonviolent Communication. Yes, that's another Such good a fucking one. great book. Another great book. And so like we're growing together. I, I changed who I was fundamentally to fit what this other person needed. And all it got me at the end of the day was a divorce. Mm. Because and I resentment was, probably. Oh, so much resentment. Because you're ultimately you're holding back the progression of your career. Progression of my career. And honestly, the progression of myself as a human being. Yeah. You know, because when you're when you're not in a partnership where you're allowed to be yourself mm -hmm. and you feel like you're constantly like, yeah, you know, gritting your teeth through it to like, yeah, you can only keep up that, that facade so much before it just finally goes, you know, what? I'm exhausted yeah. and this is who I am and she's messy and she, you know, she has like, like this little bit of a temper or this or, you know, and she does have opinions on things. And you know what? She doesn't like that restaurant that you like to go to. But oh, I've done shit. all of these things. How do you know you. my girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. You know what yeah. I mean? And yeah, no. And I'm able. <clears throat> we're both able. Sorry, did I cut you no, off? No, no, not at all. We're both able to be our full, true selves in front of each other. That and that's so what's rare. so great. Yeah. Like I can be weird. I can just the truest version of myself I can show her. And I don't yeah. show many people that because of yeah. the, the bullying and the stuff that I've gone through. So I like, I protect that. Whatever you do, don't change who you are to make other people happy. Yeah. Like you're already doing the work. Like if I was like rattling off these cop, like these book covers and you were like, well, whatever, Jen. But like every single book I'm, I'm like saying, you're like, Oh yeah, I've read that. Or, yeah. Oh my God, that's on my list. Or, yeah. Oh, What's that one about? I got to put that on my list. Like, yeah. do you know how hard it is to get men to do any kind of self-improvement or yeah. introspection? Or any it's person. hard. Like, a lot of people don't do it. A lot of people don't read, um, men especially, but, like, I don't know. Like, that 
quality is rare in a person to continually want to grow. Yeah. And um, I know some really successful people that are just content with who they are as a person. And, like, maybe they have success in these other areas, but they do very little, like, self-work. Yeah. So and thank you, you for saying that. And you and they're just, like, walking children yeah. in, like, adult clothing. Right. You know what I mean? And you're like, I can't interact with you. No. Because... There's a sensitivity chip that's missing or there's like a lot of stuff that hasn't been dealt with or you're like walking around wounding people Mm -hmm. and completely oblivious to the fact that you're the problem. You know what I mean? Like that's that's the kind of shit that I can't put up with. Cool. I have a couple more things. Uh, What's uh, like what do you think your core values are as a person? I love that you uh, have these things because very few people have had these thoughts and like I don't know. One of my favorite books – the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mm-hmm. very difficult read, but has this exercise where you visualize a funeral and people are saying stuff and you go and you peek in the casket and it's you. What are they saying about you? And that's how you... You're like, man, she looks good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, her titties still held up. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I have so really bad be, friends. Being um, good looking is one of your values. And yeah. that's that's good. That's um, fair. No, it's not one of my values. It's more um, being better. You know, being better than I was the day before and giving myself grace when I when I'm not. Yeah. You know what I mean? So everyone I think, falls short. I think learning how to give myself grace that I so easily give to other people, that's like something that is like a core value to me. Hmm. Um, I'm really big on like comfort is really important to me and not just like comfort, meaning I, I think I'm one of those people that grew up with like some weird attachment stuff where as a kid, I never really felt safe, hmm. you know? Same. And so when stuff shakes out in my life i don't feel like i have like a home base you know Mm -hmm. what i mean like i think uh uh, you probably have been through therapy and stuff like that i'm assuming of course one of the things i I talk to you about is like you have to have that safe space and i'm like i don't know what that is the strong points and you know what i feel sorry for dudes because i was just thinking about this the other day i think men have a harder time finding people to have these type of conversations with that's Mm -hmm. why a lot of my guy friends are parts of men's groups that like meet and uh, they talk about these things so and they cool. hold each other accountable and yeah, things like that and cry yeah exactly good you know cry over chicks and stuff you know yeah. what i mean like all that pussy shit yeah dude. Uh, <laughs> i love doing that but they they uh <laughs> feels good to let yeah, it out i think that men men meet all of their friends much earlier in life than women do i feel like women are constantly making new friends and new alliances and like Women friendships tend to grow and evolve and men's friendships are largely based in childhood and like high school years and things like that. And possibly for them, for you, the military, you know what I mean? Some. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've been good at but like discarding level. certain friends and like, I'm <clears throat> extremely selective with who I allow into my life yeah. and even into my keep up with you every year circle like i have different rings of friendships and the core friends and then all the core friends it doesn't matter if you're a good person and all this other stuff if you're not ambitious like i can't fuck with you like i I need a full package for these closer friends and then like it gets farther if you do certain drugs still and like party a lot you're not going to this circle you're going to be out here on this circle someone that i can't even like go out with much because i don't want to be around it i don't and i've experienced I've done those things and like I know what it does and I don't want to do it I ever again. I haven't done those things, but I've I've cleaned up the mess after people who have done it and that's a really Yeah. that's a really tough thing to watch people that you love uh go through that type of stuff. So yeah. so yeah, being safe and and comfort is like another thing that's like really big to me is like just feeling like uh that's like one of my values that's just important to me i like that i also like what you said about being giving yourself grace because one of my criticizers is like my dad or technically he's my stepdad but i Mm -hmm. consider my dad is just like his voice like you're half-assing or you're lazy and all these things and it's like what's crazy though is that voice it almost like becomes a part of you oh it is and so you do it to yourself and so when other people are doing it outside you're like guys i don't I don't need you guys to tell me that I'm a piece of shit. I'm doing that myself. <laughs> yeah, 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 for real. Like, I already have that inner critic that's, like, saying all these nasty yeah. things to me. I don't need you to double down, I don't you know? fucking need it, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I love my parents, and we're super cool now, and like, there's no more of that stuff anymore. So um, it's kind of you, a. Did you ever read? Because you're talking about like inner critic stuff. Did you ever read the book No Bad Parts? No, but I'll write that or do down. Do you know as anything well. about like internal family systems therapy? Uh, I read the, so I bought two books when I, cause I've read so many books in so many different areas and I was struggling with my fam, my parents and like how they, they're supportive, but they would always, and they would be like, yeah, we're proud. But like deep down, I felt like they don't like, they're not really, you know yeah. what I mean? There was like, and that book described it so well. And like when you first open it and it talks about how you're lonely and all this person and, and an internalizer. I'm such a fucking I'm internalizer. I'm such an internalizer too. Yeah. And the self grow Like I'm like, this is describing me to Comedy a creepy T. Comedy is the tea. only part that I am external about. You know what I mean? <laughs> you're like, fuck it. It was that audience. Exactly. I crushed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Otherwise, I mean, no, I mean, I, I, I still, you don't have to tell me when I have a bad show. I'm like, I know. You know. Oh, I'm aware. Yeah. I'm very, like, I am i don't have laugh ears. Yeah, the last time I did Jam in the Van, I ate a big shit. And it was, like, the hardest bomb I've had in a couple of years still. Yeah. And it still haunts me. And It, it happens like, less and less. Of course. Yeah. And then, but yeah, and I haven't been back there. So, like, when I do, I'll, I'll get some anxieties for yeah. sure. But so, um, yeah, core values. Um, trying to think of other ones. Honestly, like I said, self-improvement is a big thing with me that I'm constantly growing, constantly learning. I love learning. Me too. Um, especially about myself. And, and about psychology. Like, exactly. And ways I can be better, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, I think that's it. I think that's mostly. Yeah, I think those are good. Being authentic, yeah. Authenticity is huge and a lot of people don't have it. Sincerity. Nope. Yeah, I'm big on that too. Like you'll never... That's one of the things people, you know... I took a class... And it was taught by the guy that taught MASH, uh, that cast MASH, you know, back in the day. And like, he's a big casting director in Los Angeles. And it was all about like what your core essences are that people see in you that you might not see in yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's very good exercise for like how audiences see you on stage. Yeah. Right. So you go and you sit in front of like 30 people that have never met you before. And they get a list of 300 words and they have to circle all the words they think apply to you without you saying a word. Oh, wow. And so my top five returns that I got were funny, sarcastic, witty, guarded. And my top return that everyone in the class circled was damaged. What? And I was like, That's... fuck all of you guys. Wow. But it's like, I didn't realize that people could feel that off me and could see that in me. You know what I mean? And um, wow. And so like. What class was this? It's a it's an essence class. Okay. Um, and uh, I've done it in like an acting class. Yeah. So this is like that on on crack. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like so much more than that. Because at the end of the day, they want to give you like catchphrases that you can describe, kind of like those dickheadish parts of yourself, or like the parts that are less than admirable. Like to Daddy people. knows best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they try to give you other ways to say it that aren't offensive to you know women's parents. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> For me. Some of the, the phrases they gave me to describe myself were um, the most lovable asshole you'll ever meet. I like that. Uh, the smart ass Disney princess that saves herself. That's great. These uh, are all good. Honesty as an art form. Okay. Uh, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a dick. Um, at least, but like they cover all the bases. You know what I mean? Um, and so those are things that I just kind of like, whenever I'm having problems with bits and stuff, I'm like. Do, do they all do all my essences fit here? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like what is not working here? And mm -hmm. it kind of like is like a filter that I put through my life through now. You know, am I being authentic? Am I being real in this moment? Or do people smell that I'm being phony? Yeah. I love you know? that. I'm fucking striving for that too. I actually, one of the first books I'm going to do is the authenticity one you talked about. Yeah. Homecoming. Homecoming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Uh, what's one of your biggest insecurities? My biggest that you're insecurities. willing to share? Uh, this is going to sound really weird and stupid. Um, it's having imposter syndrome about being pretty. Hmm. If that makes sense. No. <laughs> you're like, I don't know what that is, Jen. Look at this jawline. Um, <laughs> I mean, but you're also pretty too. And you know it because no, everyone tells you. But just because they tell me, uh, I feel like it's phony. Really? Yeah, because I, I was very much like an ugly duckling and like uh. a, a late bloomer. 
And like when you get made fun of so much and when you get mistreated so much uh, when you're younger, like that's who you'll always be. No matter all the plastic surgery and the YouTube tutorial. Like I never feel like it's good enough. Like my own, my mom, my own mom was like my OG mean girl. Like I still remember things she would say to me about the way I looked. She'd be like, your hair looks like a water buffalo. Like something like that. We were just like, what? She's just roasting her kid. Roasting the shit out of me. And then like. (laughs) If I ever give her a dash of her own medicine back now, oh. she's like tears instantly. Oh, and I'm just like, wow, wow. You know? Um, That's tough. I'm sorry so, you had to go through so, that. So, yeah, my biggest insecurity is like, is do I get things because I'm pretty or do I get things because I'm good? Do you know what I mean? But like, you're also good on the inside, which yeah. is most people don't have that. And that is an important quality. Yeah. And I think you will get things from that. Like, yeah, yeah there's a lot of pe- assholes that make it and stuff. But like, what's the longevity of like, that? Like, she just got that because she's hot. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's always going to be people that think that. Men have said that and women have said that. Of and course. it's like, uh, how about I get things because I treat people well? Yeah. And you work I like hard. To, I like to think that I will be remembered for... The way I treat people. Like, I don't think there's a long list of people out he- out there that can say, Jen Sturger mistreated me. Right. Jen Sturger was a bitch. Yeah. Jen Stur- like You've always been very kind when I met you. and To a fault. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I think that I just always want to be remembered for how I treat people. That's great. You know? I like that. Yeah. And then I have last one, mortality. Mortality. We've already covered it. Yeah, we kind of did, huh? But well, what, what do you it? Well, what do you believe? Oh, what do you think all this is and what do you think happens? What do I think all this is? I think we're living in a simulation. <laughs> yeah, there's evidence. No, okay. So or like, um, you know what it is? Quantum I, mechanics. Yeah. I think that we are here on this planet to learn something. Hmm. Like we are here in this existence to learn something. And a lot of times it's the same lesson over and over and over again because you haven't mastered it yet. Mm-hmm. So part of that class that I took was talking about like what your myth is. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like what is your what is your lesson to learn while you're here on earth? And what can you how can you integrate that into your art as mm-hmm. like an actor or a I performer, etc. Yeah. And for instance, like when you look at some of the most successful actors out there, you know, like Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves <laughs> always plays. <laughs> That's not who I thought you were going to no, say. But instance, which I love Keanu, Keanu Reeves, Reeves, and he's very successful. But Keanu Reeves makes a lot of money playing the same dude in yeah. a lot of roles, and that's John the Wick, guy that the is Matrix. Based, it's based in luck. Like it's a guy that either has incredibly good luck or incredibly bad luck. Like he's the one yeah. or he's a stoner that just stumbles that's into also a phone unlucky booth. That he's the exactly. One. But luck can go either way. Yeah. Luck is a, is a twofold oh. thing. You know what I mean? That's and that's true. like, it's looking at the dichotomy of whatever the theme is. You know what I mean? Like both sides of it, yeah. luck versus unlucky. Um, that's his like, that's his thing. Uh, Tom Hanks is always the guy God, that's he's like, so good. I'm never prepared for this. You yeah. know what I mean? Like every role he's in, like, he's never prepared. Like, you know, he's a kid that's trapped in an adult's body. Or, you know, like, he's the the captain of a boat that gets taken by Somalian pirate. It's the same thing. Every He's a guy whose girlfriend is a fucking mermaid. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I don't know how to do this. And it's like, that's the Tom Hanks energy. Yeah, Castaway was crazy. Yes. Harrison Ford. He's always the dude that's like the begrudging hero. Like, ugh fine i'll save everybody get off my plane you know what i mean like that's his vibe that's true so i was like i don't i didn't know what my story was or what i was here learning what yeah what i was here learning yeah i love purpose he got to the the teacher came to me and he goes do you know what yours is and he saved he goes he saved me for last and i was like i i don't and he goes i think you do and he goes jen he goes Cause I was, I got very real during like the personal sharing stuff, which is obvious. That's what I do for a living. I like communicating with people and telling stories and being super personal and authentic. And he goes, everyone in this class owes you such a huge thank you because you were able to get up here and be so vulnerable that they got better results and more mm. honest results because you had the balls to get up here and just lay it all out there. Yeah. Like despite how painful some of it was or how awkward some of it was like you 
You aren't scared to be you. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage. So for me... Power of vulnerability, Brene Brown. Yeah. So for me, my lesson was safety versus jeopardy. Hmm. And he goes, you have this innate ability. And my therapist has even said this to me, completely unrelated. To make everyone around you, even when like the sky is caving in on you, feel like everything's going to be okay. Hmm. And he goes, the problem with you is, and your double-edged sword, is that you will burn yourself down in the process to make uh, sure they feel that way. Yeah, you're putting other you people's needs in front of your own. You sacrifice all the time. They cover in that adult children book. Yep. You will self-sacrifice all the time. So, and then be resentful afterwards. Exactly. So my lesson here to learn in my mortality, you know, my whole thing about mortality is my lesson I'm here to learn is how to put my own oxygen mask on first yeah, so that I can continue to help more people. Yeah. And I can be the safety other people need without harming myself. Yeah. You know? I like that. I think being one of the first Me Too cases when no one was supporting me, yeah. like, that's like the perfect example God. of the first person through the wall is the bloodiest, you know? And I've always tried to look out for the little guy. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, like, you came on my podcast. <laughs> but I've always tried to look out for the little guy. And I've always tried to look out and be... Uh, an ally where I can and fight for things that I feel like are huge injustices. Mm -hmm. And my parents think I'm fucking insane for it sometimes. Um, like I love helping other women in comedy. Like I love helping other women get spots, learn the industry, navigate some of the hardships of it. And my mom said something to me. She goes, why do you do that? She goes, aren't you scared of them passing you up? And I said, no, that's a scarcity mindset. I said, it's a scarcity mindset. First of all. And I go, and there's nothing that says their success negates mine. No. And it comes back to you and it karma. It all comes back. And, because I, I yeah. truly believe, like, I'm one of those people that when I make it, I'm bringing people along with me. Girl, you've already made it. Take it easy. You know what I mean? Easy. Yeah. But no, when I make it, make it. Like, this is just another chapter. When I make it, make it, I'm bringing someone. I'm bringing people along with me. Yeah. Every, you should, I like that. You know? So, that's what it's about. So that's... That's my lesson here is to learn how to balance that safety versus jeopardy. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Do you have anything you want to plug? I mean, you can always check me out on social media. It's at Jennifer Sturger on all the socials. Um, I'm going to be posting my first stand up clips very soon. I'm going to go. take that leap for myself. Yeah. Good. Um, and yeah. We'll see what happens. Fuck yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for doing the podcast. This has of been course, man. Uh, one I'm of my... I'm shocked your cat didn't attack us while we were doing this. Because I snatched her ass off and she's, she holds a lot of... Daddy uh... knows best. <laughs> That's right.